Hello, friends and uh, uh, grailers. <laughs> Welcome to this uh, very special recording in which we have my good friend and carnal Joshua Kutchin here joining us uh, to talk about many things. Uh, one of them will be his, uh, I don't know if, when will this be released, but I assume that by then his new novel, or his first novel, I should say, Them Always Never Died, will be out into the world, something that greatly excites me, and not just because he was gracious enough to ask me to to make design the cover for him, but also because it really is a really fine book, you know, the, the, the story, the prose, like, you know, I'm, I, I know it sounds like I'm uh, uh, blowing smoke up <laughs> Josh's ass, but it, it really, all that is warranted because this book, it's it's something that, that people will greatly enjoy, you know. Uh, so, Josh, you know, welcome and thank you for being here. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and thank you for your kind words. Um, one thing that I'm noticing as we're approaching the release date of August 28th is the official release date. Um, I feel the most vulnerable that I have <laughs> writing about anything. Cause, <laughs> really? Yeah, I mean, you know, mm. with the nonfiction stuff that I've done... Part of the, I mean, part of the reason that I do so many endnotes is because it's insurance, right? Like I, I didn't say that, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, I, <laughs> I, I have, I have stuff that I can speculate on, um, and you know, I, I try to be clear about that. But there, a lot of that stuff is just not me. I'm just sort of a synthesizer of stuff. So this is kind of like, oh, this, this came from me, and the buck stopped with me all the way on this. So, um, right, you know, and and as you know, like the the, the subject matter is kind of kind of a vulnerable thing to talk about for me as well. We can get into that later. I don't want to, um, mm -hmm. I don't want to bog down everything here in the beginning, but yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to, the, the phrase that I've been using is that I have no expectations for it, but I do have, um, aspirations for it. So, yeah, of course. Right. Uh, I don't know, maybe before we go, um, uh, get into the, the, the matter of the book, maybe we, we should start. I don't. I don't want to make like a, 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 a like a bio of you because I, I am assuming that by now uh, most people watching this will get a sense of who you are, what you what you have written in the past. You know, so we should skip all that. But I I did want to ask you something that you know. I I think I have met you. I have known you since uh, 2014. If that's that's correct. Uh, through our common friend, Mike Hanks, mm -hmm. you know, yep. and from then, uh, uh, like, we became fast friends. But I remember that right by that time, you were already this cool, like, Killian, uh, you know, high strangeness uh, and anti-ETH kind of thinker, you know, and that is kind of like a, like a position that a lot of us it took a, a lot of us a long time to reach to that to that uh, point of view because before that we were like no 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 you know UFOs are are ET craft and, and they're coming from other planets and they're you know they're they're, they're metal crafts and the government knows all about it blah, 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 blah. so it's, it's kind of like I feel like kind of like like envious like you didn't go through those growing pains or if you did. You went through them very quickly. So what was your secret? Now? Well, my secret was um, twofold, actually. It was a deep skepticism and primal fear of, of UFOs, actually. Um, and I'll explain that a little bit. Mm. Um, so I've always been interested in these topics. I was, as I just said to a, another interviewer earlier today, um, I was a monster kid, you know, monster movies were my thing, like anything with a creature, creature feature. Um, and so mm -hmm. I was always gravitating towards Bigfoot. And as you do that, you know, you're, I had an interest in ghosts and Bigfoot, but I never really had an interest in UFOs, um, partially because something always felt especially seamy about the UFO stuff. <laughs> Even like as a middle schooler, I kind of felt a little kind of skeezed out. But um, the bigger issue for me um, was that I just, I couldn't wrap my head around the idea, the fact, or you know, the supposed fact, that there were hundreds, if not thousands of different models of UFOs and an equal number of, of occupants inside these crafts. So I'm like, look, I could buy 
I could buy it if all these UFO reports were consistent, but they're shockingly inconsistent just from what little cultural osmosis that I had through this stuff. So I had that in one hand, right? And in the other hand, I had this mm-hmm. deep, terif- terrifying fear of, of alien abduction, which I attribute mm-hmm. to the fact that my dad showed me close encounters of the third kind probably when I was like eight or something like, and it's, it's not a scary film, but there's some scary stuff in there and something no, about there scary stuff there. Yeah. Something about that puppet at the end. Just, I mean, I, I, I can look at it now, like, you know, a grown ass man. Right. Um, but at the time it was just so, like for the longest time, I couldn't even look at it. And my sort of uh, fear of gray aliens in that image extended to the fact that when my nephews were born through just prior to that, my sister was like, maybe you shouldn't look at the sonogram photos because they kind of look like the big headed <laughs> aliens. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I had some moments of outright paranoia uh, when I lived alone um, where, you know, I would, I would hear this chirping sound. And then I, there, I remember one day distinctly where I heard this chirping sound that was just following me around everywhere. And then I went for a walk and I noticed this, mm. this silver s- sphere in the sky. And it wasn't until several days later after like trying, you know, staying up awake and like, you know, convinced I was going to be taken. Um, it wasn't until several days later that I realized that my phone was dying and it was Venus. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was just this really irrational fear. Um, so when I was finally introduced to the concepts of things like extended, extended states of consciousness, altered states of consciousness, it did two things for me. Um, number one, it answered the question as to why these things look like anything, because if there's, if we're somehow playing a role, then they can, they can look like anything. Um, Mm. and then the other thing was that it, from a case of personal safety, it, it implies that if consciousness plays a role in this, then you have a foot in the door to defend yourself in some sense. Um, you know, you can sort of keep that away. So, so that's, yeah. So when I started listening to paranormal podcasts, which, you know, back then, this would have been probably 2012 because I got a, a job at the University of Georgia and I was having to travel an hour each way. Um, was Mysterious Universe, and they were very much on that train at that time. And it was, looking back, it right. kind of felt like the Wild West of podcasts because, you know, Greg Bishop was doing <laughs> Radio Mysterioso a lot. And, uh, you know, I was I was... I was listening quite a bit to the Paracast back then, um, but it really introduced me to this whole world. <laughs> and and, so, and so, so I did, you know, I did, um, I kind of did, now that Tim Banal is talking about uploading old episodes of his show, he's, he's mentioned this before, and I kind of realized it's what I did too. I just absorbed all this stuff before I started commenting on it. And so yeah. by that point, yeah, I was definitely onto this, onto this track that uh, this has something to do with altered states of consciousness. So that was really the... Appropriately enough, altered states of consciousness <laughs> opened up my consciousness to to accept the possibility mm-hmm. of these things. Yeah, I'm interested, right. uh, Josh, exactly where mm-hmm. because uh, the two books of yours that most interest me uh, for a reason I'll just say in a sec was Trojan Feast and the Brimstone Deceit mm-hmm. because I've written an article previously and been very interested in like paranormal sounds and how across different genres you've right. got the different sounds, um, and I'm kind of interested in how. That, that you seem to get onto that very early on. Um, what was it? Was it, did you just notice these little? You know, for me with the sounds, with the paranormal sounds, I just noticed across reading lots of different things that I just kept coming across the same thing. I was like, "That's odd. That's odd." And I'm just wondering whether you came to it the same way. Well, um, and you know, because people like you have looked into paranormal sounds, I probably will never do a book on paranormal sounds because there's been so much good writing that's been done on it. I'm kind of like, well, you know, what, what else can I, what else do I have to add? But um, yeah, for for whatever reason, um, so my wife when we got married, she was a lot more hesitant to embrace my interest in these things. Um, and to be fair, mm. I I, I uh, pulled a bait and switch on her because I wasn't. I wasn't what I'm doing now <laughs> when we got married, you know, I was, I was on a completely different career tra- trajectory. Yeah. So, like, you know, gr- she deserves all the grace she can get. Um, but you know, one of the things that I would say is I'd say, you know, it's important to know things about the paranormal. What if you're and I would have always the, the conversation would go into this half hearted joke about like, if you see a leprechaun and he offers you a cupcake, you need to know whether or not you should eat it. So I'd always had that food taboo. <laughs> stuck in the back of my mind. And uh, there was a time when uh, this was probably looking back, probably 2014 ish. 
um, maybe late 2013, when I got a uh, an Amazon gift card from one of my sister-in-laws, and I bought J. Robert Alley's Raincoast Sasquatch, which is about indigenous Bigfoot beliefs on the coast of Alaska. And uh, and there is a myth. Uh, there's a, a myth amongst one of the tribes, and forgive me, I can't remember if it's Quackutal or Tlingit. I always get those mixed up, and I always say I'm going to look it back up, and I always forget to look it back up, but. One of those two tribes has a Bigfoot analog known as the Bequus. And I remember distinctly sitting in my you know, living room reading this book and reading that uh, if the Bequus offers you uh, food, don't eat it. Number one, it's not really food. It's it's uh, dried bark to appear like salmon. And number two, if you eat it, you'll be trapped with the Bequus forever. And that was just, because, I guess because I had that, I kept on, you know, maybe if I hadn't, grabbed onto that bit of fairy folklore, I would have never gotten where I am today, you know, just thinking about these things. But because I remember those two things and I said to myself, okay, this, this, this has to imply one of three things. And this is the only way that I see that this works. Number one, the collective unconscious is a thing like a real tangible thing that manifests in very specific ways um, across populations that don't have any contact. Or there was a lot more, um, exchange of culture between the old and the new world in you know pre the pre-columbian era or these things have an objective reality like because <laughs> you know you can talk about the persephone myth and that sort of diaspora out of out of greece and i can buy that when you're talking about africa and you know Eura uh, eurasia and asia and even south on southeast asia but you're seeing this you know in uh in new zealand and in australia and all throughout the new world um so that was really what got me onto that. And I, I have to admit that um, it's, st it still boggles my mind and, and is humbling today. The, the degree to which that book was embraced by the community. Um, you know, I, I, I started a relationship with Patrick Weege, whose books I read in middle school. Like it's just so bizarre to me. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I still have his, that copy in middle school that I got of his uh, Lake monsters and sea serpents book that he author co-authored with Lauren Coleman. So, <laughs> You know, um, and yeah, uh, so I, I, I suppose that for a while I was on this trajectory of like looking at the minutiae and that's kind of still what I, I like to do is to take a look at something that gets mentioned a lot, but nobody really explores and pulls apart or, right. you know, something that's mentioned in a paragraph. I'm like, no, wait, stop. What does this, what are the implications of this? How deep can you go on this one particular thing? And maybe do you think you might learn something about, these phenomena, if you actually took the time to unpack it from an interdisciplinary perspective. And, you know, at the time I wrote Trojan Feast, I had, I had two master's degrees under my belt, which definitely makes you into someone who, uh, who wants to look at things in that sort of interdisciplinary way. So uh, I say mm -hmm. that, not, I say that not to brag about my two degrees, but just to say that I spent a lot of time in grad school and that will definitely <laughs> sort of put you down in that. Oh, let's, <laughs> let's, let's go down a JSTOR rabbit hole for a couple of hours, sort of, sort of mentality. No, it was, so. um, in the brimstone deceit, there's actually a phrase at the start that I highlighted, I remember, and I just want to read it out because it just resonated with the way I sort of approach research on these things. And I, I don't think there's enough of it these days. Everyone's, especially with the whole UFO scene at the moment, everyone's on this high level mm -hmm. and no one's digging down into the details. And, and you wrote at the start of the brimstone deceit, smells seem quite inconsequential upon cursory ex examination, a mere byproduct and afterthought to bigger, much grander events. Upon examining the literature, however, certain patterns take shape, some more immediately apparent than others. And that's what I love, that whole looking for the patterns that appear. And I, and I know right. you do have to be careful you don't see patterns all the time. But yeah, and I yes. probably do. But, <laughs> but yeah, well, 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 that, thank you for, for highlighting that. I mean, that's that kind of is sort of, you know, was, was and to a certain degree has continued to be my guiding ethos. I, I think I've gotten a little bit broader in, in terms of perspective since then. And it would be, I have a couple of smaller niche projects in the back of my head that I may or may not get to sometime in the next 10 years. But I, how do I say this without sounding indignant? Maybe I just say it. Um, it's kind of frustrating that a tuba player had to come along and write a book about paranormal <laughs> smells. You know what I mean? Like, like, how many decades <laughs> do you have to study this stuff without saying maybe we can find out something by examining this one aspect? You know what I mean? Um, right. So, you know. Yeah, and, 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 sorry, sorry to yeah. interrupt, but another of my favorite researchers along that line is D. Scott Rogo. Same thing, just yes. digging down right. into mm -hmm. little details. You know, that's where the meat of it is for me. 
finding those patterns, right. finding those little details. Well, it, it seems almost as if the phenomenon wants us to do that. It causes, causes us to pay attention, pay attention to things that other people just discard and think, well, you know, that could be anything or whatever. But maybe it's in those little details, in those little, you know, things that people just scratch their heads and forget about it after it happened, that we can find real tangible clues, you know, and that's what I think that, like, like, like Greg says, I agree that, you, that when your job, your your research really shines, you know, in trying to say, well, wait a minute, let's pay attention to these that other people just overlooked because the paranormal or, or high strangeness is about paying attention to the things that have been overlooked for so long. I, I appreciate that. And it's been, you know, if, if I have some sort of legacy in this field. Um, I, I really hope that I have inspired other people to do this sort of similar thing. Um, one of the best examples of someone who's done exactly, I always like it when people write a book that I don't have to write. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, exactly. And, uh, and W.T. Watson released this, um, I believe it's called Mysteries in the Mist, which is just looking at mists and fogs in these encounters. Ah, and nice. um, he took it in a little bit di different direction than I would have. But like, that's the kind of scholarship that I really want to see is, is taking a look at this thing that you hear over and over again. And you kind of just, you know, toss it out. But like, yeah, what if, exactly. what if we can learn something about it from that? So, um, right. Yeah, and then, like I said, I've gotten bigger and bigger until, you know, Ecology of Souls is, like, the biggest perspective that you could have. But <laughs> hopefully someday I'm going to get back to smaller books and, and more focused treatments, yeah. Right, right. Uh, another thing that I wanted – well, first first I wanted to mention something that when, when you said something about uh, this lore about uh, Bigfoot offering you something, and that means that you get uh, mm -hmm. trapped forever – I don't know if you mentioned that in Food Taboo, but it's, it strikes me as interesting how Albert Ostman, this logger who had this amazing story of being uh, kidnapped by a family of Sasquatch. I mean, the way that he managed to escape from his uh, entrapment was by offering food to the Sasquatch, you know, right. kind of like reverted the spell. Well, and way. you yeah. know what, Miguel, I'm glad that you bring that up because there is... Um this theme of inversion that appears in other world narratives, right? That I believe in uh, there's uh, right. in Gregory Shushan's book on uh, near death experiences in the ancient world. He talks about um, there being, I can't remember the exact Hindu tradition, but there's a tradition where, you know, the afterlife slash other world has this in battle of inversion where everything's, you know, the pacifists take up their bows and the people who normally f fight, fought with bows would fight with swords and just inversion, inversion, inversion all the way down. And, uh, you know, similarly, one of the ways that you got out of being pixie led in the old stories was to turn an article of clothing inside out. And we find, you know, right. alien abductions wearing their p pajama bottoms on their tops and their tops on their bottoms. So the idea mm -hmm. that Albert Osman would get out of, what might have been another world, you know, if you take the weird Bigfoot perspective that he actually, he offered food to them is, is, is another clever little inversion like that. Yeah. Yeah. So getting into other topics, I wanted to touch something that uh, you mentioned to our friends on Soraya's uh, Slack, uh, in which you seem to point out there is a very interesting and notorious divide between the attitudes of those personalities that are on the, on the top of the so-called disclosure movement and all the plebs that are just cheerleading for them on social media, like UFO Twitter and such. Like those people like Elizondo, um, I don't know, Colm Kelleher, all those guys seem to show or be more open-minded about, uh, you know, high strangeness or, and they are more open, have a more open attitude about the nature of the phenomenon. They don't say, well, you know, obviously they are ET, you know, or they are whatever. They, they say, well, who knows? Even though uh, the majority of you for Twitter are still embedded on a nuts and bolts paradigm. So why don't we talk about that? You know, why do you think there is like, like the people at the, at the top are people that I suspect have read your books, <laughs> while the people at the bottom of the disclosure movement, they probably or maybe they haven't read your books, or maybe if they did, they probably hate them. <laughs> probably, I mean, I would imagine as much. 
Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of what I can say without oversharing who said certain things to me. But I, I do know that there are some people that the disclosure movement thinks highly of um, who are forces that move in the disclosure movement. They move in the movement um, who mm -hmm. have read things like Ecology of Souls. Um, and, you know, it's not really that much mm -hmm. of a secret because, you know, I think in some videos of Lou Elizondo, you can see that he's got a copy of Ray Hernandez's book, you know, on the, uh, on mm -hmm. the desk. And, you know, having sat through Ray's lecture at, at, at Rice University earlier this year, um, you, you won't find a more staunch anti-materialist than him, honestly. So, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it, it kind of feels a bit like, you know, that old trope of, you know, there being a religion for the elites and then another religion for the masses, um, if you want to sort of extend right. that sort of religious language to what's going on. And, yeah, it, it is peculiar that um, the sort of rank-and-file disclosure folks, and, you know, maybe this is just them sort of wrapping their head around the phenomenon in general, but I find it really fascinating that something is going unsaid in a big way in all these conversations. Um, you know, and everybody's wondering about the secrecy around these topics. And I would argue, um, you know, <laughs> relax. There probably is an afterlife, right. <laughs> to sort of coin a, coin a phrase. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I think that that is a much bigger impediment to the authority that, uh, governing bodies want to exercise upon us than any sort of extraterrestrial disclosure. And I think that's where this leads is it leads to really big metaphysical questions. Um, you know, now having said that, mm. um, I have seen some, some chatter after a recent Peter Lavenda interview about, you know, uh, he said that the, uh, he, Lavenda said that he felt that the genie was out of the bottle literally, both literally and figuratively. And of course everybody's like, Oh, it's going to be Jen. It's going to be Jen who had their money on Jen. Um, <laughs> and, and uh, I'm just, I have a hard time believing that authority structures would disclose extraterrestrial life. I cannot imagine a scenario where something as wild as the Jen, which you're not going to find somebody more sympathetic to that idea than I am. You know, I'd probably push it back into the fairy folklore, but those two things are very similar, the fairy stuff and the Jen stuff. You're not going to find anybody more sympathetic to that theory than me, but I just can't see a, a, a world where that is the, the end destination of whatever is unfolding now. Um, and so, I do think that there are people who are talking about these things at, at some of these quote unquote lower levels, not using that term disparagingly, but yeah, for the most part it's people who are still in this 1950s model of the phenomenon. And you know what, for all I know, maybe that's what's going on. Maybe it is screen memories all the way down, but I, I get the sense that those who are read into these things um, and who are sort of guiding a lot of the disclosure movement um, are kind of, grappling with these things and getting ahead of that sort of existential issue that a lot of other people are going to have to, to, to get, uh, to get used to. I mean, as, as, as a very talented illustrator once some um, pinned in a recent cartoon, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't know if it's going to, I don't, but again, I don't think it's going to be, you know, um, people turn their aggression against these other forces. I think it's just, everybody's just going to be at home, you know, not going to work and staring at their carpet, trying to figure out <laughs> what, what existence is, you know? Yeah. All of a sudden all people are going to be like hanging, uh, uh horseshoes <laughs> <laughs> on their doorstep once again. Yeah. Just I mean, to be sure. <laughs> that would be what an interesting world that would be. Yeah. Um, so, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, there's that old, uh, uh apocryphally attributed quote, um, to, uh, I believe it was John Jacob Astor that, you know, um, millionaires don't believe in astrology, billionaires do. And I'm not sure if he said that, but mm -hmm, there is mm -hmm. something fundamental to that in the fact that the people who uh, guide a lot of our culture, and I would assume this would extend to the disclosure movement, um, have availed themselves of some very peculiar interests. And as a purveyor of said peculiar interests, I'm kind of all for it, honestly. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, I don't know, I mean, it's been over five years since the bombshell dropped by Kane and Blumenthal on the New York Times. Uh, and regardless on, on how public opinion has changed, 
on, on the UFO phenomenon, whether the stigma has been lifted or not. Uh, do you think there's been actually a change in the behavior of the phenomenon itself? You know, do you see do you see that there's been an increase in activity, or or is it just a matter that maybe we're just paying more attention to it, where, whereas in the past people just uh, dismissed it or didn't report it? I am not entirely sure. I feel like so much of what we know about, you know let's say humanoid encounters, because that's kind of what everybody's really interested in at the, at the end of the day, right? Like they want to know who's driving the thing, right? Right. I feel like we find out exactly. about so much. I feel like we find out about so many of those years and decades down the line. You know what I mean? Um, uh, it certainly isn't like, you know, it's not like the, the crazy seventies right now. Um, at least not in, you know, the English speaking world. You and I, Miguel, have talked about the fact yeah, that because that in Peru yeah. I, 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 sorry <laughs> yeah, to bring this no, up no, you're good. You because right now in Peru there seem to be a lot of like things like what happened in Colares in the nineteen seventies, you know, like natives in the Amazon reporting uh encounters and attacks from entities that are reported to be very tall, uh, wearing some kind of like armor being capable of levitating and attacking people using what seems to be like razor blades or something, you know. I remember that I read that, like, oh, my God, you know, it's Project Prato all over again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Predator come to life, I mean, you know. Um, exactly. So I don't I, – I personally have not seen that in, in the UFO field. Um, you know, we, we get a lot of interesting stories. I – I kind of want the Las Vegas landing slash crash that happened a few months ago to be true. Although I realize there are a lot of problems with that story, but it has a lot of the flavor of some of those seventies encounters. Um, so I kind of get a little bit of a thrill when I read that. What I have noticed um, extensively, and this may or may not be related. It all depends on your you know appraisal of the phenomenon. I have noticed a lot of reports of, <sighs> I wouldn't even say cryptids. I would say like folk horror spirits. You know what I mean? Um, like the, uh, I don't really love saying the name because there's a lot of indigenous prohibitions around it, but um, the whole skinwalker thing has blown up on TikTok. Um, you know, and that's not the water that I like to tread in. And I don't necessarily think that those are always credible encounters, but not with skin, skin walkers in general, just encounters on TikTok. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, I see a lot of people who were encountering eldritch things less so than strange things seen in the sky. And you know, that might be a function of the fact that UFOs are kind of considered passe because everybody knows that UFOs are real now. I'm not, I'm not sure, but I've gotten the sense um, from what I, where I'm looking that people are, gravitating back towards these older modalities of interpreting these phenomena. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if there right. are, I wouldn't be surprised if there have been more fairy encounters in 2023 than there have been, um, Interesting. than there have been in the UFO encounters. And I say right. that, I say that partially because I, I have to look at a lot more social media than I want to with some projects that I'm working on. But, um, but also because, uh, you know, Simon Young, uh, who runs the Beachcombing Bizarre History blog? Uh, fantastic fairy scholar um, yeah. is preparing the release of his latest fairy census, and I have not spoken with Simon directly about this, and I probably should before I say this, but um, but I I have heard that he has noticed mm -hmm. that a lot of these fairy reports of the past several years are hewing back towards the older interpretations of these things. Uh, as opposed to these little, you know, these little vixens with their wings, you know, flying through the air. Um, and I think that speaks to the, the same impulse that's driving the magical renaissance. It speaks to the same impulse that's the rise of mm -hmm. paganism and the rise of astrology. I think it's all tied into the same thing. It's not the, the zeitgeist of the West is not one of 1950s uh, space saviors right now. I think it's much more right. the old ways, you know, not to. You think, the it's, it, <laughs> yeah. you think it's a matter of uh, like uh, some meme that Greg shared to, uh, today on X that I wanted to believe, but now I don't be because the government told me UFOs are real. Like, is it that now that the governments are like, quote unquote, 
accepted by the government that they're become like square or something that is not cool well, you to, know. to be in it. And now then the kids say, well, now let's, let, let's go with, you know, astrology or trying to read uh, Solomonic magic, you know, because that's that's where the government will never go. Yeah, I, I, except that's where they've gone. But but yes, that's where they'll never go. Exactly. That's, yeah, but behind, yeah. behind closed doors. That's, that's where they'll never go publicly. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I've always had this suspicion, and I'm not sure if it's really – I would be interested to talk to someone who's better informed on this to get their opinion. I've always had the suspicion that there's probably a cyclicality of, you know, religion on the culture and then the religion becomes really restrictive and you have people butting against that and that, that inspires atheism. And then people fall, go fall so far down that path that they end up inadvertently perhaps depriving their life of meaning and seeking something greater. So then they flock to paganism and then religion comes in to squash the paganism and we just go around and around in circles. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's very interesting that you have this sort of return to these older ways of thinking on the heels of the frank frankly the death of new atheism which um isn't is not what it was mm -hmm. you know in the late 90s or early 2000s at all no, for sure yeah. um so i think that's that's part of it i think part of it too you know that sort of i i, I believed in ufos until the government said that they're real sort of thing i mean yeah i just mm -hmm. there's so much distrust um i mean i'm sure I'm sure it's the same way there in Australia. <laughs> and I know it's, I know it's that way in Mexico because I had to, to no. do some writing about that. But like, there's so much, there's such a bifurcation of, of cultures now. And it's, it's like, unless our guys in office, we don't believe a damn thing. Um, so it's, it's like I've said, you know, uh, was it, um, it was Bryce Sable and Rich Dolan who wrote that book, um, you know, after disclosure and talking about, disclosure. talking about a post disclosure world. And I'm like, look, not in the way that you meant it, but we are in a post disclosure world because no amount of disclosure is ever going to convince people, you know, Joe Biden, that's Joe cool. Biden wins next year and says, here's commander Z Blort from Zeta Reticuli and half the country is going to go. <laughs> He's full of it. This is a psyop. Donald exactly. Trump wins next yeah. year. And he says, this is commander Z Blort from Zeta Reticuli and half the country is going to go. It's a psyop. I mean, it's just, it's just where we are. Um, and yeah, so, you know, Jim Binal said, you know, that uh, the COVID uh, pandemic was like, was the alien. Yeah. It was our aliens, you know, like the government said, look, you need to stay indoors and you need to wear masks and you need to get vaccinations. And all they were, yeah, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I so, don't believe you. So, yeah. And, and that's sort of, if, if I had to place money, which is a foolish thing to do to ever try to predict the future, right? But if I had to place money on where this lands, I would say that it will look a bit like we've come to grips with the Kennedy assassination. You know, famously, this this language that's been put into this United States legislation about releasing information on non-human intelligences has been modeled after the release of the Kennedy documents. And the good news is, is that I think I heard that about 99% of those Kennedy documents are out. The bad news is, A, what's in that 1% that wasn't released, and B, exactly. the 99% that is released is redacted, so it looks like Swiss cheese. So what we end up with is this cultural sense that, okay, something fishy went on. We all know something was strange. We all know that the official narrative is not what happened, but we can't say exactly what it is. And I suspect that's probably going to be, you know, famous last words. I suspect that's going to probably be the end of this disclosure cycle is that there is a general sense mm -hmm. that yes, there is something strange going on, but it's not going to be answered in any way that we can point to a star and say, that's where they're coming from or anything like that. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, unless uh, David Grosh come to the next hearing, like bringing these back <laughs> here, you know, yeah, like like, in like Mr. Sp Day, or, 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 Will Smith, yeah, here it is. <laughs> I was gonna say it's it's, it's either there's... it's either Mr. Smith goes to Washington or Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street, where there's just these bags <laughs> of letters. It might be Miracle on Thirty Fourth. Anyway, either way, just the bags of bags of documents. Yeah, I just. So I, 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 I guess that's kind of an optimistic stance in a way that like there's going to be this widespread acceptance that there is something anomalous about it. But, you know, it's I, I don't think it's ever going to be as concretized as a lot of people in the disclosure movement want it to be. Again, I may be eating crow in a year from now. I, I do think that this is not the end of the current disclosure flap. And I do think that it's going to get more interesting before it gets boring again. Um, there have been too many people saying too many things that would completely wreck their careers for me to not think that, if that makes any sense. Not that people don't make outlandish claims all the time, 
But there have been people that are saying things, and it's like, okay, well, they're they're obviously expecting something else is imminent. So I think it's going to get more interesting. But um, at the end of the day, I'm not saying this because I believe I have an accurate read on the phenomenon, but I feel like if you look at the literature, whatever this thing is, is weird. And that has to be reconciled um, and internalized um, into this movement, into human beings. It's, it's like, it's like shadow work that's awaiting us all. You know what I mean? <laughs> like we've got to, we got right. to figure out how to, how to cope with this. Um, I just wanted but, to yeah. um, loop back quickly. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, you're good. Mm-hmm. When you're talking about uh, before about social media and monitoring social media, how that's part of what you're doing at the moment. Um, just coming from a different point of view, how do we sort the wheat from the chaff in terms of, you know, I'm very cynical these days, but I think we all agree that influencers these days have this massive, like everyone wants attention, oh. everyone's seeking attention and the crazier story, the weirder your story, the more attention you're going to get generally. So how, do you have any approach for how you look at things and see if they they have a genuine feel or whether they feel like someone's just seeking attention? Oh, no, this is something that I thought about in a long time. And, and, you know, I alluded to my end notes earlier and like, that was kind of the impetus for it too. I remember sitting there getting ready to write a Trojan mm-hmm. feast and being like, do I have to vet every single one of these cases? Because that's a full time. Like I would just now be coming out with a Trojan feast. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, exactly, yeah. so the, the end notes were my way of saying, look, I don't know if this particular case is true. You can find where I found it. A and B mm-hmm. for every one case, that I present, I'm going to try to present three or four others so that one of them might be accurate. You know, it's just, just to show that there is a trend rather than hinging everything like, on one like particular case. Like a shotgun case. approach. Yeah, kind of like a shotgun approach. Um, you know, there's some stuff that I've found out later um, that that has made it into my books that was sort of recognized as a bit of a, a fraud or a hoax. Um, there's a famous example mm-hmm. about this airplane that I talk about in the Brimstone Deceit. Um landing and the entire crew being massacred and it smells like rotten eggs inside. And it's kind of funny in, in, mm. in uh, Jerome Clark's review of brimstone deceit in 14 and times. He's like, I've got to claim that one. I helped, I helped propagate that. <laughs> so it's kind of a, a funny, a funny moment again, Jerome, like I wish I had the copy here, but you know, Jerome Clark, who I, I had to, my mom had to put masking tape over the cover of the unexplained when I was a kid. Cause I just kept on reading it. But, um, mm-hmm. so, so yeah, I, I, it's, it is a little bit the shotgun approach. I do have certain, I do have certain, uh, standards that I don't use when I write my books. Um, I have a no Reddit policy. Um, and look, there's probably plenty of true stuff on Reddit, or at least if the inter- interpretation is not true, the person is being honest about what they think happened. Right. There's probably plenty of that, but I just, it's just a, a, a line I didn't want to cross similar with a lot of these, um, so some, some YouTube channels are that way as well. You know, there, there's some, especially if, you know, there's an interview between somebody, that's something that I might cite. So, you know, and part of it's gut feeling, um, gut instinct, uh, and you know, a, a certain, I, I tend to have a certain detached agnosticism about a lot of these things. Like for me personally, work aside for me personally, I see a lot of things and I put it in my interesting if true basket. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I see it and I'm like, okay, that's really, that's really neat. It could be a hoax. It could be true. I don't know. It's the same reason why I'm not really interested in, you know, UFO footage or anything like that. It's because it's, it's so ambiguous to me at this point that the two Hills that I, I will die on, um, you know, in terms of that things that aren't in my interesting, if true basket, they're in my own personal true basket are the reality of psi phenomena, because that's been so well attested to using, you know, standards in the laboratory that, um, a lot of scientists, if they were being intellectually honest would acknowledge, but they don't. Um, and you know, a close, well, a close second would be, you know, the near death experience, which as, you know, Greg has a lot of, <laughs> a lot of veridical information and a lot of, you know, th- there's a lot of compelling yeah. stuff around it. And those are the, those are the two things where I'll say, okay, yeah, I'll stand up and fight for this idea. Everything else is kind of like, uh, I don't know. You know? Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's funny because um, that's one of the things when, when I wrote about near death experiences, I tend to favor older ones before like mm-hmm. say 1960, because that's when it really started right. getting written about. Because when you find mm-hmm. those repeating elements right. that we're both interested in, you go, oh, they didn't get that from literature or something. To the point of where 
like when I've written about things, sometimes I've gone, should I write about it? Because as soon as you write about it, you're almost poisoning the well. That's, that tr that's true. Mm, that's people true. then know, okay, if I'm going to do a fake report, then I just need to quote some of these elements. <laughs> so I kind of favor right. some of those older things. There was some yeah. alien abductee re researcher, alien abduction researcher, who had a question that he or she, I can't remember who this was, would never. Yeah, it was both, both Hopkins. Was it Bud yeah. Hopkins? Yeah. Yeah. Had a, yeah. a certain question that they would ask that they wouldn't really ever put out there, but it was a question that was sort of yeah. their tell um, for the truth or not of this. Um, a fun inversion of that. Uh, this had, really has nothing to do with our conversation, but I'll bring it up because um, because I think it's so charming. Um, in one of Ginny Randall's books on uh, Star Children, uh, she has like you know mm -hmm. a list in the back of like ten or fifteen points that you might consult to see if you are a star child and one of them says do the words sobek alp mean anything to you and it's like you look at that for a while and you're like so and then you realize it's an anagram for placebo <laughs> and it's that's <laughs> that was her tell to see if people were just like yes absolutely yeah um so yeah I, I don't know you know i just i, I just i just had this sort of agnosticism about a lot of this different stuff and you know i i am a big fan of uh concepts like hyperstition like you know i don't really know if the moon is hollow but i like that idea and you know i'm not going to make policy i'm not going to make policy based on it you know i'm not going to make policy based on it and i'm not going to deride people for not believing it but it's kind of a fun little idea to have in my head canon and i tick off boxes as i see things that you know flatter my yeah, confirmation exactly. bias but you know that's really that's really my my own biggest problem with the disclosure movement because i've been pressed before like you know why Josh, why do you believe someone's fairy encounter and you don't believe the testimony of someone before Congress? And I say, it's not that I don't necessarily believe it. It's just that there's a proximity to policy and power. And as you get closer to that, it makes me anxious. And, uh, you know, it's easy to weaponize a Tic Tac over an aircraft carrier. It's hard to weaponize space pancakes, um, quite frankly. So, you know, I so w when the stakes are higher, I get more skeptical um, of, of these sort of things. Yeah, what's that? Well said. Okay, let us talk about the book. Let us talk about the mole ways never dies. You know, first of all, like I said, I already read the book, blown away by it. By it, I'm a very slow reader, guys. Everyone, listen to this. I'm a very slow reader, and I read this. How many pages? Uh, uh, the final verdict. I've got my proof here with that lovely proof. Um, band across mm -hmm. it across it the final count is 483 <laughs> okay yeah. i read that in a week and that is like uh, you know the uh, uh, personal best for me uh because i could i couldn't put it down really it was great uh so being very cliche in this question you know after you establish yourself as a writer of nonfiction, what prompted you to like make the jump to fiction? Do you mind me rambling? Because it's probably going to be Rumble a ramble. Away, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so first of all, I want to say that I am so glad that you were on, the, on this project. I've been talking to you for years, <laughs> over half a decade about getting you involved on a, on a book cover. And I think this was the absolute mm -hmm. perfect fit. I'm, I'm very enamored with the, the creepy hand in the, in the bottle. Um, I have always had an interest in, in fiction. You know, I mentioned being a, a creature feature fan. Um, but the older I got, the more I started approaching, appreciating rather um, a lot of literature that I would say has something going on underneath the hood, if that makes any sense. Um, so the example that I like to use are Jordan Peele's films. You know, um, you might not have encountered those literal antagonists in those films, but you have encountered white supremacy. You have encountered... Um, you know, some of the themes of alienation in us, or you might have encountered some of the things that Nope is talking about. I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> I don't have Nope pinned down as well as his other films, but it's obvious that, you know, the creatures, the antagonists are stand-ins for something that is a much more serious and much more universal idea. And I just didn't think I was capable of doing that. And I'm still not sure I did it, <laughs> um, but I tried to do it. And I found something that kind of worked um, in that sense where the, the antagonistic forces um, are interchangeable with the real pragmatic forces that are happening to the characters. Um, so that was part of it. Um, 
the other part of it was, you know, after you write Ecology of Souls, what the hell do you do after that? You know, I mean, like I, I seriously thought about, <laughs> I seriously thought about just walking away from everything um, because <laughs> yeah. p- part of me doesn't have a lot to say right now. Um, yeah, which it's is almost a, like yeah. in the field of dreams, you know, the only thing to, left to do is to actually go to the other side of the, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the yeah, field and see what's there. And, and, and I don't say that because, again, I want to be very clear here. I don't say that because. I think I got it right, quote unquote. I just said that because I made my own sort of peace with it, if that makes sense. Like I reconciled a lot of outliers mm-hmm. that I didn't know what to do with. And I'm like, this, this is cohesive enough for me. So that's, that's, that's why I say that. So like, you know, I think the only thing to do after that is something radically different. And this is radically different being my first work of fiction. The third thing um, is that I have known enough authors of fiction over the years who have told me these stories about, yeah, I tried to write my character into X, Y, Z, but they wouldn't let me. Or they they said, yeah, my character came to me and told me we should do this or that. I'm like, back up a minute. (laughs) Like this is, this is a really (laughs) strange idea. And I think it's a lot stranger than a lot of these authors want to admit. Um, I, I don't know if it's a, thought form or a tulpa or part of the collective unconscious, or it's some sort of retroactive Eric Wargo style time loop about bringing in to fruition the project that already exists in the future. But it does sound like something that is kind of on the numinous side. Um, And I wanted to experience that because I have the worst luck going into the field (laughs) um, with this stuff. So there was an on demand element to what I would, deem a sort of supernatural experience to this that I want to experience, um, that I wanted to actually have that encounter myself. And, you know, I'll be damned if it didn't happen. Um, there were moments, uh, most often on between the, between sleep and wakefulness, surprise, surprise, as I'd be dozing off and a character would come to me and say, this is what it should be. <laughs> you know, this is what I need to do. Um, the the most profound example of that, Miguel, since since you've read the book, is you know there's a a ritual at the end, and I had sweated for weeks about like, oh, I've got to make this ritual really authentic, and this and that and the other. And then once you once that character was fleshed out enough, and again, the character who gives this ritual to the protagonist it became very apparent that I shouldn't be worrying as much about the authenticity of the ritual. Let's just say that. And it was, that was an idea mm-hmm. that I would not have had. And I still don't feel like I did have it, but it, it came to me nonetheless. And it's interesting. You'll even read people like I read an interview with Ray Bradbury um, a couple of months ago and where he would just sometimes wake up in the early hours of the morning and go down to a study and pull a book of his off the shelf and read a passage. And just, he said he would weep because he's like, I don't know where this comes from. It's like, it doesn't feel like it came from me. So I wanted to experience that. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's a measure of quality and I'm not saying that it was a download or a channeled work, but certain things definitely fell into place with an ease that I was not expecting uh, to the extent I've written that... an article about that actual topic. Yeah. Uh, okay. Meeting, okay. The, meeting, the, meeting their makers. Cause uh, William Gibson tweeted once that one of his right, characters yep. kind of sh- sh- kind of showed up to him and he wasn't expecting it at all. And then I went into mm-hmm. the whole thing of Alan Moore, you know, meeting, one of his characters guy, and, um, and then right through yep. uh you know comic books you have that same thing too yeah. a lot of comic mm-hmm. book writers didn't, have had that didn't neil thing. gaiman meet the devil or something or yeah neil That's... gaiman met uh, at a halloween party met the devil choronson okay yeah you know? and and choronson yeah. demanded to uh to uh his character to reappear like on on a on a new uh you know story the Sandman, so he will be remembered, you know. And Je- Jeff Kripal covered some of this in, uh, I think, Mutants and Mystics. I think it Mutants was. and Mystics, yes, yeah. wonderful book. So I didn't, I didn't have anything that dramatic happen. Um, there is a character who is a pharmacist in the book, who, uh, I, I, I ended up picking up a prescription, and the the lady who gave me the prescription looked very much like her. And was actually wearing a, a Soviet-style Ushanka hat in the middle of the summer, which was kind of odd in and of itself. So I haven't seen this particular pharmacist at this pharmacy since then. So maybe it was a tulpa, but wow. um, I do get your point, though. Yeah. E- even just in your head, they seem to take on a life of their own. You know, they, they right, just do yeah. their own thing. Yeah, yeah. And to the extent that there was a, there was a section of the book where two characters meet in the bar, and uh, 
a, a substantial portion had to be rewritten. Uh, I don't think Miguel's actually read the rewritten portion, um, the rewritten version no, of it. I, I... Um, but when I was rewriting that at the behest of my editor and good friend Barbara Fisher, when I was rewriting that and, and rearranging it and sort of leaning into the character a little bit more, it didn't feel like it was a rewrite. It felt like the message was garbled the first time through, if that makes any sense. Right. Like it feel it felt like, you know, oh, this is the way it was always supposed to be. Like that was Yeah. It wasn't just a clearer you know, transmission. Yeah, a hundred percent. hundred percent. Um and it's it's a weird it's a weird it's it was a, we- a very strange feeling. Um and you know it made the made the book better because of it, um, so yeah I, so I had a lot of different motivators for this. You know I wanted to, I wanted to commemorate um, a significant portion of the book, maybe, maybe most of the book, um, takes place during the pandemic. Um, you know I uh, have a lot of musician friends um, who just really struggled through that period. Um, I am a musician myself, but I also have, thankfully, especially in 2020, I can say this very thankfully, that I have this these other interests to sort of keep me preoccupied and um, make me feel like I'm getting some forward momentum. But I have also have a, a vast majority of my musician friends, especially the ones who primarily make money from playing and teaching music, um, just felt completely rudderless. And I wanted to sort of encapsulate some of those uh, some of those feelings for posterity and sort of you know, 2020 feels like it was a million years ago and it feels like it was yesterday at the same time. Um, but yeah. there's a lot of feelings that I had, uh, a lot of sensations that I had that I wanted to sort of get down on paper as well from that. Um, another part of this is I remember uh, when Miguel was reading it, um, it takes place, the climax of the action takes place in the autumn and, and Miguel was like, Oh, it's gonna it's gonna climax on Halloween and I'm like, No, 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 no. <laughs> part, part, part of part of the goal of the book is to show because like you think about certain bits of media having uh, embodying a certain time and place and like there are some spooky summer movies I guess and there may be a couple of spooky Christmas movies, but there's this time in between like there's this time in between Halloween and Christmas where like doesn't really there's not a lot of spooky spooky stuff there's um there's a book called a winter haunting that i remember being relatively good i can't recall who wrote it but um it was set in november so so part of the goal of the book too was to show that oh no october uh, halloween is the start of spooky season it's not the end of spooky season it's the and from there on out you know from there i would argue all the way at least until the winter solstice is um is just a one giant ritual of the old ways so yeah so, and, and again, I feel well, we've so, been talking for. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> we've been talking for a lot of minutes about the, the the novel, but we haven't really like explained what the novel is about. I don't know if you want to like share. That's your what I was going to say. Morning. Yeah. Um, uh, this has been what the is tri- it about? Well, this has been the trickiest thing to talk about because I don't know how far I can take uh, the synopsis because I think there's something that's kind of rewarding about seeing the protagonist come to grips with what they're facing you know see them realize the, mm-hmm. the strangeness of what they're facing um but there is a character by the name of rick coulter who was a musician um and his life's pretty much a mess um and it's a mess before he goes into the pandemic and it only gets worse after he's in the pandemic and he's during this period of isolation where um he starts to realize that he is not as alone as he thought he was in his property um Having said that, uh, the actual story <clears throat> spans 123 years, uh, and there's uh, some flashbacks that inform uh, the current situation. And I, it's kind of a, you kind of get an idea of where it's of how it's tied in. The closer you get to the reveal, but I think that's what I hope that's what a good reveal does. Is it doesn't feel like it's cheating, like it just came out of nowhere. Like you can kind of play the game along with the the book or movie and kind of guess it. So. Um, and yeah, I was drawing upon uh, a lot of the themes that I, I know about, which is part of the reason, like, this might be my only novel, because I don't know things, <laughs> I don't know many things as well as I know North Georgia music, alcoholism, <laughs> and fairies. Like, <laughs> like, you know, it's a pretty specific combination. <laughs> so um, to that end, it's, it's there's a lot of authenticity in there. You know, I'm sure some guitar players might quibble over some stuff that I put in there, but, um, but yeah, so, so yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, 
I, I wanted to have a, a certain level of authenticity. And, and the biggest place where it was important for me to be authentic was not only capturing that experience of sort of being a, a rudderless musician, but also um, having some degree of fidelity to, since the cat's out of the bag, fairy folklore, um, and also modern paranormal thinking. You know, there's there's more than a little George P. Hansen in the book <laughs> um, at the end of the day. Um there's some there's some tricksterism that rears its head, uh, in with one of the characters. Um, but yeah, I, but you know, a lot of the stuff that I see that draws upon fairy folklore specifically, kind of does this cafeteria style approach where they'll pick and choose things that kind of fit the, the their narrative for their own reason, and they'll just throw out something that's completely off, you know, out of left field. And uh, while that's fine, I understand that, you know. I probably did that a little bit here and there myself. Um, I really wanted to to write a, a folk horror fairy book for people who were into the fae folk. Um, and who, I love and who that in is, terms of uh, like Strange and Norrell. I don't know whether you've read Strange and Norrell, yeah, but mm-hmm. just that, that feeling of authenticity and the deep dive rather than just skimming over. Yeah, they, 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 that, 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 that particular work does a really good job. Um, trying to, you know, a, a, a work that was hugely influential to this. I'm not sure if we've read it. Miguel's probably sick of hearing me talk about it, but it's Ian McDonald's King of Morning, Queen of Day. Um, mm. And it's a, it's, it's a lovely book. I need to keep needing to reread it in addition to this pile of books that I have over here. But um, it, it's, a, it's a generational story of, of how the, the good people interacted with uh, three generations of, of women. Their story starts in Ireland. And, uh, you know that was that was that was hugely influential uh, for me writing this book, and you know, and it's it's it gets kind of odd towards the end, but um, it does a pretty good job of of hewing close to to those older legends and myths and legends. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it was just something that I wanted to see written, um, something that sort of commemorated commemorated the pandemic, commemorated um, Appalachia, uh, commemorated. Mm. Um, that spooky season between Halloween and Christmas. Um, and uh, also, you know, presented rescued. I would even dare say, you know, some of these, some of the silliest aspects of the paranormal back to their rightful place. I mean, that's one of the thing that's things that um, I always find interesting is how people <laughs> get further and further into these topics. They, you know, they start out interested in UFOs or Bigfoot or whatever, and, and they eventually find their way towards fairies and, you know, for a lot of quote unquote normies, like that's the punchline, right? It's like, well, I, I'm interested in UFOs. It's not like I believe in, you know, leprechauns or something. And, and if you're really diving into this and you <laughs> dig deep into it, you sort of end up saying, Oh, this thing that I took that no one else takes seriously has, I don't think it's the most accurate description of what's going on. I don't think it's quote unquote the answer, but it, this thing that people use as a punchline has a lot to say about, what people experience when they confront the paranormal. Um, and I think that's something that uh, always deserves being shouted from the <laughs> shouted from the bleachers as it is. Yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, showing to one of my sisters, the, the, the cover once I finished it and she said, Oh, what's, what's the novel about? And I said, and I said fairies. Yeah. It's a fairies, but that's a creepy looking hand. What's yeah, the, well, yeah. That's, that's not fairies. Like, uh, well, how, how do you know? <laughs> how welcome do you know to the, welcome to the conversation. Like? Yeah, welcome to the conversation. Exactly. You know, let me let me tell you something. You know, here's here's a list of books that Josh recommended you should read. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, getting to to the locations in which the the plot takes place, because. Uh, that's something that really struck me, you know, obviously because of your interest and because of the topic, you know, Ireland is you know, almost like a imperative to, to have. And also because it has some, I will say, autobiographical elements, you know, South Carolina mm-hmm. and Georgia. But you mentioned Appalachia and, and I wanted you to talk about some, some 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 more about Appalachia because I I guess for people who don't live in the United States, we don't really get a glimpse of how special that place seems to be. You know, in sense not only yeah. of in geography, 
you know, and, 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 and those aspects, but also in the sense of the culture that seems to have taken roots there. So if you could please, you know, uh, share your thoughts of why you think Appalachia is so important. Well, it's, it's become something of a, of a minor meme, but, you know, the, the Appalachian Mountains are among the oldest in the world. They might even be the oldest in the world, but they're among the oldest in the world. And they, they do technically stretch into the highlands of Scotland. Like, <laughs> that's part of the, the same chain that started, you know, eons ago. And, um, you know, what really remains interesting about Appalachia is that so much of it does speak to... Um, the sort of, I don't want to say a lot hasn't changed because obviously a lot has, but um, a lot of, of well, appropriately enough for the name of the book, you know, them old ways never died. <laughs> you know, it's that wasn't the original intention, uh, but you know, it's that's one of several meanings that you could get out of the out of the book, um, out of the title, and there is a chain of custody maybe that's not the maybe that's not the best term um there is a an unbroken sort of sense of heritage between those two locations between you know uh that part of western europe and in appalachia there's sort of a sense of of shared history there i've i've heard it argued i'm not sure if this is just a matter of you know, Appalachian pride, but I've heard it argued that, you know, some of the dialects that are still spoken in the hollers today are the closest that you will find amongst Americans uh, to, you know, the King's English, basically. So th there is a sense of just um, age that, that permeates this, this part of the world. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to me to notice the, or to examine the level of, um, of activity that you see in Appalachia. I mean, you know, it's, it's a, it's a recurring question that I've often asked myself, um, why is West Virginia so spooky? You know, <laughs> even though West Virginia is not in the book, it, obviously the Appalachian mountains are part of West Virginia. And, um, you know, I was, I was watching a video on, uh, on YouTube and it was this fellow who took an hour long video, but he's, um, he's just stopping at different towns in West Virginia and, and, Eastern Kentucky and just talking to people and talking about the way of life and how they live. And it occurred to me halfway through that um, a lot of these folks are living in ways that are not too terribly far removed from the way that human beings live for, you know, millennia. Uh, you know, obviously there are things like the phone and the internet, but they're much less reliable. There's this one couple that he's talking to who are like, you know, yeah, the internet goes out for a couple of weeks at a time every now and then, you know, and that's a shocking thing to hear in, in 2023. Um, there's a sense of community that uh, you don't really get in a lot of other places in the U.S. Um, a sense of families staying together in these hollers, um, a sense of neighbors pitching in and living that sort of communal lifestyle. Again, the lifestyle that we that we lived, uh, you know, forever. Um, and so I, I feel like the conversation on this could veer into anti-intellectualism or anti-modernity. And that's not really the point that I'm trying to make. I do think that there is something to be said for the incidents of high strangeness and the fact that these people are sort of embracing these older modalities of living. I think that there might be it, a connection. It's interesting in terms of that, what you're just saying there, like Australia as a European country is very young. Uh, 1770 and then settlement uh, 1788 or so and so when you're in urban areas in australia there's a feeling of very much a feeling of not magical not you know there's just not that feeling but then if you know i've been because i grew up in north queensland which is northern mm -hmm. australia you head into some of the uh, more outback areas and you're into quinking country which is like some of the uh, indigenous people, mm -hmm. some of their beliefs up there, and you come across, you know, cave paintings, etc. All of a sudden, you just feel like all this oppressive, like it's it's here all of a sudden, you know. It, it, it's 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 the it's the weight of it's the weight of millennia. I mean, I think there's some. I think the current research suggests that you know, indigenous Australians are are some of the oldest extant groups that that, that still exist. You know, um, so yeah, it's it's an interesting juxtaposition of the the shiny and new colonial. <laughs> imprints with the you know older the ancient indigenous beliefs and you know there's there's a little bit of that tragically um appalachia 
you know, there's, there's still a lot of Native American influence there, but, you know, we did have the removal, which took a lot of Creek and Cherokee out of the area and relocated them to Oklahoma. So I don't, I think, no, I mean, obviously we did lose something very profound with that. Um, and, you know, I think an argument can be made that they, in that sense, there's a kind of haunting emptiness to them too, um, because it's, it, you get the sense that this is a land that was known more intimately um, than it is now. And again, to be clear, this is me not saying that there aren't Native Americans in Appalachia. There are plenty. Um, you know, the, the Cherokee uh, reservation in Western North Carolina is is you know massive. Um, but uh, but there is the sense that um, you know uh, strangers in a strange land kind of thing. Uh, so as so mm. it's again that that juxtaposition that you noticed in Australia of the new with the old. It's like these people who have these older ways of living for a place that they're no longer, (laughs) no longer living. Yeah. So there is a certain, um, there's, there's a certain magical quality. It does feel like you're stepping back in time and not in the pejorative, like, you know, Oh, these people are so backwards sense, but in in terms of the sense that, Oh, this is just an older, slower way of living. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, anybody who's from the Northeast of the United States sometimes feels that way coming to the South. Well, people in the South sometimes feel that way (laughs) heading, heading up the mountain into Appalachia. Yeah. It's almost like we, in the modern day, we're too busy to stop and take notice of the things in between, you know? A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, you know, that also has something to do with, again, why is West Virginia specifically so spooky? Um, that they're just, you, you do find yourself with that, with fewer distractions, whether you realize it or not. Um, you know, I, I, I dare say that if the internet went out for weeks at a time around here, I would feel much less urgency to do things <laughs> online and whatnot. So you, you are, there's a, probably a sense of uh, a more mindful sense that comes out of it as well. Um, now, of course, you no, know, tragically, the incidence of, of drug use in Appalachia, especially among the younger generation is just through the roof. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, mm-hmm. You know, something that the region is going to have to figure out what to do about it and why it's happening. But, uh, yeah, there's something kind of mournful about Ap- about the Appalachian Mountains that I wanted to introduce a little bit of in the book. Um, and to that extent, uh, there were some moments that I'm sure Miguel saw, too, um, where, you know, I have no idea if I'm ever going to write another work of fiction. So... When I took an opportunity, it was like, okay, now I'm going to describe the leaves and I'm going to describe these leaves because I don't know if I'm ever going to get another <laughs> chance to just sort of stretch like this. So yeah, um, there, there are some spots that are probably a little bit too indulgent in that regard, but I, I did have a mandate to um, a personal mandate to a, not only have characters that have arcs, but also pace it sensibly. You know, I grew up in a household where uh, my father subscribed to the trades, like he was subscribed to you know, uh, I think it was weekly variety at the time. So like <laughs> I grew up in a household that really appreciated like the, the craft of cinema and the craft of storytelling. So I was like, okay, this needs to feel like you're a quarter of the way through the book. And this is the end of the first act. You're halfway through the book. This is the end of the second act. And I think that even though it's longer, <laughs> it's on the longer side. I think that having that sense of pacing and that sense of things happening sort of helps carry readers through it. Hopefully that's the intention that, and I also made a rule to myself that uh, just about every chapter would have something spooky or supernatural or paranormal happen. I think there may be two or three chapters that don't, but for the most part, something happens in every chapter. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If anyone's right. read Alan Moore's Jerusalem, your book is short. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Or you know, even even American Guides, and honestly, even some of the Stephen King stuff. I mean, it's you know, you, you look at uh, guidelines for how long books should be in their pr- respective genres, and you know, a lot of them are saying like seventy thousand words. And I honestly, I don't think I could have gotten through this in seventy thousand words. And Neil, Neil, Doctor Neil Rushton, who uh, was kind enough to provide a. <clears throat> And in a blurb for the book, um, he said that he too was concerned about the length at first, but then he realized as he got into it, like the story needs a chance to breathe a little bit. Like you've got to see some of the characters um, make decisions and mm-hmm. have consequences to their actions and things like that. So ho- hopefully it, yeah. hopefully it worked out in that regard. Yeah. There were characters uh, in the, in, in the novel that my attitude toward them changed completely 
Like mm. at first I was, ah, I hate this guy. And then <laughs> yeah. Like, oh my God, this is my favorite character. Y yeah. And then we're all like, oh, this guy is a, a total you know, <laughs> piece of, of shit. And then there was uh, this redeeming quality, like, oh, I didn't see that coming. You know, that, that really, that flip that totally caught me on, uh, on guard. Like, what like was, oh, wow. Yeah, so I was. That's the reason. I was talking with Barbara, and I know exactly who you're talking about, of course. Um, and he's one of those characters that I'm not sure if I'm supposed to like, but I do like. You know what I mean? Like, I I really, if, if I met this guy, I would not want anything to do with him. But um, he sort of ends up being one of my favorite characters in the book. Um, oh, yeah. mine too, for yeah. sure. And and um, there's there's never going to be a sequel. Um, I don't know the famous last words, but like, well, come on, Miguel, it, it's got a, it's got a sense of closure. Oh, there and, there. Uh, and, it can be, it can be. and then the movie director comes, and then oh, oh, we'll we'll talk about the movie adaptation in, in a minute. No, I, yeah, I, I, but, I can uh, I can think of an I, I can think of a, a decent way to do a spinoff um, with this character that Miguel is alluding to. Um, but but th but so much of the stuff is so hard earned at the end that I don't want to take that away from the characters. Um, and maybe that's the character right. talking to me again, you know, being like, "No, don't take this away from me." But yeah, it's it definitely exactly. Has that yeah. Let me leave, damn it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, speaking, of, I mean, I I, I praised your prose long enough, but yeah, one of the things that really uh, what uh, was freshly was very refreshing to me when I read the novel is that you acknowledge something that many people in paranormal research find very, very uncomfortable, and that is the role that deception and hoaxes has in all of these, yeah. like the concept of priming the pump that mm -hmm. is so, that is known in, among season parapsychologists, but obviously people in, in other areas like ufology, they don't want to hear about it, you know. It's you know, oh, yeah. hoaxes and, and and are the worst thing worst thing that ever happened to the field. Uh, but you seem to like find a place for that in the novel, you know. And I found like that to be incredibly interesting. That originally wasn't going to be as big of a piece, but again, <clears throat> as that character developed, I'm like, no, this is entirely consistent with the way that he would behave, and it, it also gives me a chance to to say something about, you know, about my personal interpretation of the phenomenon that mm -hmm. I don't as easily fit into books. And so, yeah, this this particular character, <laughs> the same sort of um, uh, rascal that uh, Miguel was mentioning earlier, um, is sort of obsessed with, with the power of belief and... Uh, it, he he needs some of the characters to believe things more or less depending upon his upon his uh, particular uh, goals. But yeah, it was something that I wanted to definitely include in there. And you know, for the most part, the book has four primary characters, and uh, they all sort of nest upon this spectrum of of belief to disbelief. You know, you have one character who is a landlady and she is like completely bought into everything. You have another character who's the pharmacist that I alluded to, and she's highly skeptical of everything. Um, you have this character that Miguel is talking about, this sort of deceptive character who acknowledges the reality of these things, but realizes that there's some blurriness in the middle. And then you've got Rick who really is the sort of um, actual objective observer in a lot of ways. Like he can kind of go either way in terms of what he thinks. Um, and yeah, it was interesting to sort of like, see how the character's actions would um i feel like i'm being super coy not saying names but you know it's their spoilers and like nobody really has a context for who these characters are so i'm just gonna say the characters it's really interesting to sort of bounce these characters off of each other and see how they would pull each other into different directions or repel each other mm -hmm. in different directions uh to or from belief in what's clearly happening uh to rick over the course of the novel and yeah part of that does involve um does involve some deception and uh you know mm -hmm. it also sort of ties into as i as i mentioned earlier about you know there being a ritual at the end that i wasn't sure if i could pull off as being authentic and that really not mattering at the end um that's another thing that i wanted to sort of convey is that a lot of the traditions that we have around these things whether it's ritual magic or it's you know folk magic or it's even you know just generalized ufo belief um, it's all kind of bespoke, uh, 
it's all stuff that we've sort of cobbled together. And I would argue in some instances, it really does take its meaning from the fact that you have so many people believing in it, you know, very, very much in the same way that you were talking about with Neil Gaiman and uh, Alan Moore and, and uh, Gibson running into their own creations. Like, I think that we severely underestimate the importance of something like belief and focus and intention when we're examining these different phenomena. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing I wanted to talk about is that how we said, you know, that I don't know how, how will pin this book. I don't know if it is a, a book of horror. I don't know if it's, uh, you know, fantasy. Uh, I don't know if it's magical realism. Uh, but obviously there are very, very scary uh, passages in the book. You know, like really like I wouldn't have read those uh, passages uh, all alone in the middle of the night. I would have a hard time, you know, sleeping without the lights on. Uh, but obviously there are, there are, you're talking about Rick, who is, I guess, was the main character who's like surrounded by all these uh, things that are happening uh, around him. Uh, but it seems like you don't show those forces to have like a true malevolence, if you will. Like you're not dealing with like Pennywise, who you say, well, you know, <laughs> right, a right. fucking evil clown that wants to eat your soul. You assign a certain neutrality to this other that is the prime antagonist of your novel. And, and I don't know, if they, is that how you see the phenomenon <laughs> In general, like amoral, but not necessarily like evil. I, 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 I you know, it's kind of funny that you say that because I'm not, I'm not even sure if that was intentional. And there, there keep, there keep arising these things that I'm, I didn't really intend. But like thinking back to how I view these phenomena is completely consistent with the way that I look at them. I mean, yeah, I, I, um, I, I think the the forces that are that are assailing Rick are are shrewd. Um, in that very sort of Western European fey folk sort of way, like, you know, they can be beneficial or not, but at the end of the day, it's, it's all about technicalities. You know, it's all about the technicalities that you engage in and like, you know, well, I'm sorry that you didn't, this isn't, this isn't from the book, but this is from, you know, an account that I read from the Isle of Man once, you know, I'm sorry that you bumped into our tree, but we're going to have to blind you now because those are the rules. You know, <laughs> if you hadn't bumped into our tree, we wouldn't, the rules. if you right. hadn't bumped into our tree, we wouldn't have blinded you. It's nothing personal. It's just, you know, so, so there is kind exactly. of, there is kind of that vibe, especially as um, Rick's, especially as Rick's um, lines of communication with the phenomenon become more and more open at the end and, and more and more explicit at the end. Um, there's something else that I didn't really yeah. intend to, um, I didn't intend to put in there, but kind of, it kind of crept its way in. Um, there's a flashback where one of the, um, spectral antagonists <laughs> here i am dancing around the terminology again but one of one of the spectral antagonists um in this flashback sort of uh doesn't seem surprised by what's going on and i was like that's kind of an interesting idea and again it's kind of in a time loops idea kind of a, an idea about the uh, the phenomena being um being an what's the word i'm looking for um it's almost as if the phenomenon is uh a detached observer constrained by the narrative. Yeah. 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 And, and, and can, and can take that sort of hundred thousand foot view of what's going on. And so I tried right. some interesting things to see if I can coax that out um, of the reader and have, yeah, the, yeah. have the reader. You, you got very creative. <laughs> well, we'll see. You got very creative. We'll see. And, and I really appreciated that. Like, like you were really like pushing the limits of the written word and trying to convey uh, the strangeness of what the characters were encountering, you know? Right. Like, you know, I, I think I might have even mentioned this to you, but if, if, if I, I, you know, either of you have played uh, the, the original Arkham Asylum game, um, there's a moment where Batman is about to fight the Scarecrow. And, you know, the Scarecrow's whole shtick is about putting fear into people. And the developers had the interesting idea of putting a glitch into the game as you confront Scarecrow that looks like you're game console is crashing like the the screen gets all pixelated and it freezes and makes a strange noise right. and I w I've, I've always yeah. been really interested in, in those those you know 
Um, some people call it breaking the fourth wall, the technical term uh, that I only learned after doing some research for Jack's um, Jack Hunter's deep weird essay is metalepsis. That's the actual term. Um, but this idea of sort of making, bring you unwittingly into the action. And I, I, you know, in a perfect world, um, the book would describe you as the reader sitting where you are, but that obviously can't happen. Um, I'm sure that someday we'll be able to do fun things with AI and Kindle books and, and have like, you know, put you in the, in the mm-hmm. book. It can engage it's your surroundings. Um, and your GPS. But yeah. It's interesting <laughs> talking about that and, t- and talking about triggering the phenomenon, etc. Um, I don't know whether you've watched the TV show Devs. I wrote an article about this. I had a lead up of just a whole bunch of synchronicities with that show. And then in like, the crucial point in the show, right at the end, where I can't give it away because there's a spoiler, right. but the moment where everything changes and all this, our TV shut down, and I thought it was part. Of, I thought it was. Yeah. I thought it was part of the yeah. show that it was because we, we just sat oh there God. for like 15 seconds waiting for it to come back, and then I was like, "Oh, I think our TV turned off," and we turned it back on. <laughs> But the headspace I was in for the rest of that evening afterwards is really interesting. It's almost put me in an altered state, just that actual happening. Yeah, and, you know, there's an argument to be made that, um, you know, a lot of these paranormal researchers were, you know, some of the most celebrated cases of paranormal researchers um, and experiencers end up writing themselves into their own stories. You know, Keel kind of experienced this, and and the phenomena started looking back. Um there's an argument to be yeah. made that that Whitley was sort of writing himself into these into his early pre-communion fiction, um, right. and you know I'm I'm really interested in that. And there's some really interesting scholarly work, especially if you go down um, some some of the studies on surrealism and cinema about the use of of metalepsis as a uh, as a device. Like I think it actually if it goes there's an early version from like victor hugo and it's it's while a character is climbing a ladder victor hugo actually says while he climbs the ladder we have time to discuss this and and that's sort of an early <laughs> version of of the, the character <laughs> stepping off the page um but you know uh there there's also an interesting um example that i read about uh that i ended up using where um there were two kaisers i believe this was obviously pre uh, Otto von Bismarck unifying Germany. Um, forgive me, anybody, if I get my German history wrong. But there are two Kaisers watching a video or watching a film of themselves um, on screen together. And there was someone, there was other people in the audience was screening for a documentary or something like that, or just you know some film footage of them. And the film broke, and everything went dark. And and the, there was at least one person in the audience who has been quoted in some scholarship on metalepsis, who says, you know, I had this fleeting moment as to whether or not the two Kaisers that would reappear when the lights came on were the ones from the film <laughs> or or were, the, or the ones that were watching the film. So yeah, I, I've always right. been fascinated by those sort of you know never ending story kind of ideas. And it doesn't right. happen a ton in the book, but there are a couple of spots where I, I did my best to sort of show that these. Um, these forces are situated outside of even the narrative that you hold in your hands. Um, so, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I kept remember about uh, Jeffrey Kripal, Kripal's the Mutants and Mystics and how he keeps saying, I, I think, I think that uh, the core of his argument in, in, in his paranormal related book is like making us realize that we, we are, characters in the story, right? And the moment that you get that realization is that you get the chance to change your story. Like that, mm-hmm. that seems to be like the main goal of it all, you know, like almost like the man- magnus opus, like the Gnosticism, like uh, Nirvana say, oh, I am a character, but I am, I'm also the writer. So I'm going to almost like, a, you know, I don't know, a cartoon character. I'm, yeah, I mean, I, I think- I'm writing my script here. Yeah, you know, I've, I've alluded to this a little bit, um, you know, about sort of the influence of the book had on me. But, um, you know, I, I did check myself into into rehab for alcoholism in late 2020. And uh, it felt like a good time to do it for a lot of different reasons, but not the least of which was the fact that, like, you know, I, th- I think that the world should have con- con- checked itself into rehab in a sense, you know, it felt like the perfect, like dividing point. I'm not talking about, I'm not even talking about like substance abuse. I'm talking about like, it felt like the perfect pivot point for so many things that could have gone in a positive way. And instead, you know, uh, so 
I, I feel a, a degree of resonance there, but um, one of the things that really helped me out, I just, I wrote, I wrote so much um, while I was there. I got known as the guy who was just like writing in a journal all the time. Um, and some of it made its way into them old ways will never die. Um, them old ways never died. Uh, I, I found a certain amount of, of strength in the recovery process and still do, um, you know, cause it's always ongoing. Um, in, you know, Campbellian archetypes and, and Jungian archetypes and, you know, thinking about like to the, to the degree that we're talking about, you know, writing yourself and authoring your own story, you know, um, it should be a goal or it can be a goal. I'm not telling anybody how to live their lives, but it should be a goal slash could be a goal to apply these archetypes to your life in such a way that you hit these narrative beats. Right. Um, and so for me, um, and again, I'm not telling anybody how to live their lives, but I think that there, there's a useful way to pull yourself out of desperation in this. For me, I was only able to come out of that by saying, okay, this is my belly of the whale moment. You know, um, this is the, uh, this is the, the cat in the tree on fire, <laughs> you know, in the second act, um, you know, and, and, and to really sort of take a look at that and be like, okay, my life is a story and there might be a template to extricate myself from the situation by leaning on these allegedly universal archetypes. Um, and that was one of the most powerful things for me, you know, and then thinking about slaying dragons and how, uh, you know, you can slay the dragon or you can, you know, maybe just acknowledge that the dragon is really powerful and walk away from it. You know, I mean, that's what, that's what Luke Skywalker does, right? Like he doesn't try to fight Darth Vader. He just tosses his lightsaber. Away. So, um, mm. so, you know, in that sense, I think that there is, again, I'm not saying that anybody, I'm not saying that I am, I'm leading a healthy life because I've got a lot of personal work to do, but I think that there is a certain amount of, positivity that can be gleaned by leaning on those ideas and by looking at your life as a narrative to be written. Um, and yeah. by recognizing these moments as rises and falls on this journey. And it sounds kind of touchy feely, but I hope you need I a mean, motiv I, motivational I mean, poster now on the wall. Yeah, like, <laughs> live, live your life like a mythic <laughs> archetype. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly, yeah. You know, I mean, it's, yeah, I, I just, it's, it, it's what worked for me. Um, you know, it might not work for and, everybody. Yeah, yeah. There's even a point in the, in the novel in which there's exactly that. Said, yeah, the, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I went through like, my own. Live, yeah. live your life as if you're the hero who has to slay the dragon, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you even, know, the, even if you don't think you are, but uh, you know, just imagine it. Yeah, and it, it doesn't yeah, have to yeah. be as dramatic as goblins, or it doesn't have to be as tragic as as a substance. It can just be like you know, hey, you know, my dragon is is getting angry really quickly, or something. You know, any any number of things, exactly. um, and just you know, yeah. viewing that, you know, it's not something necessarily to be ashamed of. It's 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 a part. It's the antagonist in your story. Do something about it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Imagine if you're the paladin and your and your you know quest is helping the the land lady, you know, to help him with the trash bags. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I've, there's been a meme that's there's like there's, that, there's, you know? there's been a meme that's gone around that says you know live uh, do your do your day job like it's an RPG, right? And you know. Um, and you know, accept your your fetch quest from your exactly. boss to to go and change. Get, and you get yeah, exactly. And it sounds so trivial, yeah, exactly. but it, it really you get, does. You it, get points. You know, it 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 has a re-enchanting quality um, in your life. So now now do you see why I feel so vulnerable about this book? <laughs> like it's a lot of <laughs> it's a lot of raw, unexposed nerves that that made their way into it. But um, and to that to that extent, I'm sure that some people are going to look at two of the main characters, Rick being a musician and this other character that we've alluded to being something of a paranormalist and say, Oh, this is a, this is Josh's 500 page therapy session. And he split himself into two characters. Right. Like, and that's his not ego yeah. on his Eve. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and there's, there's a, there's, there's an absolutely fine reading of it that way, I suppose. But, but these characters are more than, than, uh, than me. And that's something I had to say as I, you know, 
pressed out these pressed word documents into the hands of friends and family was to say, you're going to, you're going to recognize some stuff, you know? Um, but, okay. Uh, so we already know that you want for that mysterious character. We're not naming. You want Matthew McConaughey to be the, the, the actor who plays him in the movie or, or TV adaptation. But what about Rick? Have you thought about who we want Rick? No, there, there's, there's, there, there are a couple of characters, you know, Rick and, and, and Bora, and since we're going to go ahead and start naming some of, some of these characters, um, I really don't have a great idea of, of, of who they would be. Um, Rick would have to be someone who is, you know, able to pull off schlubby dad bod in a really charming sort of way. So, um, I keep having, I keep waiting for the moment that Steve Berg finishes this and volunteers to be Rick, but <laughs> not saying you have a, not saying you have a schlubby dad vibe, uh, Steve, but I'm saying like, there's, there's, <laughs> we love you, Steve. there's gotta, there's gotta be an accessible sort of, you know, warmth to it. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, and as far as, as far as the mysterious character that shall not be named being Matthew McConaughey, uh, Matthew McConaughey is a little bit on the older side and it's not that I'm ageist about it. It's just that. The right. character's a little bit younger, you know. So would my second choice would be Timothy Oliphant, and he's sort of getting up there too. Mm. Um, in my mind, they're still like you know in their forties, but um, so I don't know. You just have to go with a bunch of unknowns, and you know, to that extent, I uh, I do not have expectations for this. As I said, I have well, aspirations. You already for this, know so. that I want Elizabeth Debicki for a very you know particular character there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other character that, um, is, um, is definitely already cast in my mind, um, is, is the landlady. Um, and, uh, there's this, Mm. there's this character actor by the name of, uh, Martha Plimpton. Um, she's in this charming, uh, show on freebie of all things. I know that that sentence has never been uttered before in history. (laughs) Um, but there's a, there's a show on, on freebie called, uh, sprung. And she plays almost the same character. Um, she was also in uh, her other famous uh, television role was in Raising Hope. I was trying to remember that as well. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of wouldn't mind seeing that sort of that sort of fan casting. But um, you know, it's, it's that's I didn't I I have to be comfortable with the fact that this is what it stays forever. You know, I can't let myself daydream too much, but, um, sure. but if, but if it would get to that point, but at the same time, but if if it does get to that point, it's, it's all hands on deck for my friends and for my friends. Like it's, I'm going to be like, we should get so-and-so for this and -and so-and-so for that. You know, these guys, yeah, it could be something, something, you know, something could come out of this. Well, I'm out of, uh, I'm out of questions, Josh. I mean, thank you for your time. Uh, uh, I guess the last thing I would quest- ask you is, uh, are you working in, in, in something else? You know, I, I really don't want to for a while, but I'm going to. Um, <laughs> you want to take a break. The, you know, the problem with writing big books is not for me writing them and getting it down. Um, you know, if, if I have a good day and a clear idea of what I can do, nine or 10,000 words in a day is not unheard of for me. Um, the quality of those words is up for debate, but th- the thing about writing big books is not that that's not the problem for me. And nor do I lack a certain amount of faith in the reader because people seem to have really enjoyed ecology of souls. And that's huge. Um, but the problem is the fact that when you go to do proofreading, it takes obviously, you know, if it's a, if it's a hundred and if it's a 200, let's say it's a 270,000 word book, right? Uh, I could proofread a 90,000 word book three times in the same amount of time it takes me to get through that once, you know? Um, and obviously this is not 270,000 words, but you, you take my meaning, like the longer the book, the longer it takes to just proofread it. So I'm always constantly like stressed that something's going to fall through the cracks. So I need a little bit, I'm going to take it easier. Um, I'm jumping right into another project, but I am taking it a little bit easier. I have a project coming up with Barbara Fisher that I'm really excited about. I have another project coming up with Allison Jornland that I'm really excited about. And uh, there's a project that Timothy Renner and I have been kicking back and forth for a couple of years that we will do um, perhaps even two projects that we're, we've been kicking back and forth and, you know, we'll get to it when we get to it. Um, uh, 
you know, I'm, I'm really excited about all that stuff. You can notice that all those have co-authors because <laughs> I'm ready to have some help. Um, no, I, 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 I'm just really looking forward to collaborating with people who are not only um, on the ball, but also just good people. And, you know, I'll, I'll reiterate this again. The people that I've met through this are, are among the best people that I've ever met. Um, you know, I, I'll never forget Tim. Tim Renner and I were driving back from a, a paranormal conference and we said to each other, we said, you know, people who are into the weird stuff are a lot nicer than musicians <laughs> because we're both musicians. And it's like, yes, yeah, a lot. Yeah. A lot nicer people generally speaking. So, yeah. Okay, Josh. Well, we thank you for your time. And, and like I said, I'm very excited for, for this book. And I, I know that is going to, you know, make hate waste, not only among, you know, people who are into the, the paranormal stuff. I think, I think he's going to find a, a bigger audience than that. And I'm so happy for you. And, and when is the book coming out? It's officially going to be out August 28th. Uh, as of recording, this is the 18th. And it's uh, Kindle is available for pre-order. But I would just keep an eye on the Amazon page, too, because... Um, much in the same, you know, it's, it, it can be, it can be difficult to time a release. So you kind of have to put things out a little bit earlier than they need to be released right. because you want to build in time for some mistakes and whatnot. So I would keep an eye on the Amazon page for that too. So, uh, but anyway, either way on the 28th, it will be available and you won't be able to get, you'll be sick of hearing about it. <laughs> you won't be able to get away from it. I'll, I'll see to that. So. Okay. Perfect. Uh, Greg, anything else you want to add? No, no, I really enjoyed this interview. Thanks very much, Josh, for taking the time oh, to do it. It's so great finally, you know, meeting you, as it were, even though we're still very far apart. It's it's great to finally uh, Literally to chat. on the chat. other side yeah. of the glove. Oh, yeah. no, much, it's it's yeah. great to chat with you in real time. And, and Miguel, I will never say no to seeing your beautiful face. So. Good luck <laughs> with the book, Josh. Thank you so much. <laughs>